Uh, it's great to be back, and I just want to kind of update everybody on everything that's going on with the ministry in Ireland, and then um, if we feel like it, we can play, I can play a traditional Irish song, but it's going to involve some interaction on your part. But we'll see if we'll get to that point, if we'll do that or not. It's up to you, really. So I know you guys, uh, I keep in good contact with uh, Brett Miller, so we're close. We're even talking about maybe taking a trip down to see him in that, but uh, it's great to have it's great to have a friend like him that has come from the same place that you can bounce stuff off of and talk to and do those, those things. I'll be honest with you, I love what I do. Very, take what I do very seriously. I, uh, eternal lives are at stake, whether you're here. I always say you're, you're either a missionary or you're the mission field. You're one or the other. And um, let me explain a little bit. Uh, today I want to just tell you a little bit about the family and where we're at. Uh, I want you to see how we've connected, give a short overview of the climate of Ireland, the work we do, and then we have some new future plans that we're doing uh, that hopefully you guys will be real excited about because we are too, and then how you guys can help. So next slide is about us. Of course, we're a family of three. We've, we just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. I could give you the old joke that my wife hates because she's not here, and I won't get in trouble. Nobody will tell her. They always say we've been... We've been married for 10 great years, 25 total. Uh, she doesn't like that either, yeah. Quinn is now age nine. He attends a little local school around the corner from our house. It's a, all public schools are Catholic schools in Ireland, so he attends a Catholic school. And we volunteer at the school for everything. So they treat him really well. And when they go to do confirmation or confession or on any of the little bits that they have, he always gets pulled out. And either I take him home or... There's a couple other kids there too, and they go off together and color or do whatever the whatever kids do nowadays. So, but it's taken the five years that we've been there that long really for people to begin to trust us. When I first got to the school and I would walk up to a lady and say hi, they literally I've had my back turned on me from a hello. And then when we started to volunteer for everything, parent association, picking up trash in the neighborhood, everything, all of a sudden I showed up at school and they're coming up to me, oh, hello, who are you? And da 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 I was like, all right, I guess picking up trash worked and that's good. So it's taken us that long for people to start to trust us. I now get emails and people calling me saying, hey, what does the Bible say about this? What does it say about that? What's your church about? Hey, we begin to trust you because we see what you're doing for us. Oh, you didn't just come in for a year and then leave, you know? So it's been... It's been really good in that sense. And it's also taken us, honestly, five years to learn about the culture. You know, I just was in Georgia last weekend. That's another world. My parents are from Niagara Falls. I was up there the weekend before that. That's another world. You know, I preached two weeks ago in Randolph, Ohio. And I got up at 9.45 like I did here. And the guy, as I, as I was switching with him, he goes, hey, you have to preach to 11.00. It's like, it's 940. You want me to preach for an hour and 15 minutes? He goes, yeah, the chicken doesn't arrive till 11, and if these folks go downstairs and there's no chicken, we're in trouble. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll preach to 11, and we went on and, and did it. But it's always funny to connect with the different cultures, even within the United States, and there's different cultures even within Ireland, and we're finally getting to the point where it's like, oh, I know what that word means, and I know to use this word, and I know not to talk to this person about that and this person about that. So how are we connected? Next slide will tell you. We moved to Cheyenne in 2006. When I moved to Cheyenne in 2006, we came from a bad church situation. And I wanted nothing to do with church. And there was one gentleman here, there's probably many, but the one gentleman God used to have us sit down at the Barnes and Noble down here and sit and chat with him. That man was Mark Perry. And we sat with him for three hours. Well, I should say this. Genesis sat with him for three hours. I really wanted nothing to do with him. <laughs> It wouldn't have mattered who it was. I really just was, was disgruntled, didn't want anything to do with it. And Genesis grilled him for three hours about what this church is about, who you are, if we went there, what would we expect, and da-da-da. So I came to church. And I'll be honest with you, in 2006, I came to church here because it was easier to come to church than to argue with my wife about why I didn't want to come to church. I came. And I came, but I saw something. I saw something in, all, in everybody, and it was different. And then on a lonely stretch of I-25 in 2006, I got converted. God changed me. 
And I repented at that moment on the side of the road and pulled away. And from then on, I was devoted to whatever Christ wanted me to do. And that's taken me halfway around the world. It's taken us to China, Romania, everywhere. All from that. I should also point out, April 4th, 2004 was the last time I had a drink. And as an alcoholic, moving to where I am now is nothing short of a miracle from God. And he can do that in anybody. 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 We adopted Quinn in Cheyenne in 2008. No, he was born in 2008. We adopted him in 2010, I think. Not long after that. And then the call to missions came in 2009. In 2012, in the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, we flew over the spot where the Titanic went down. I wasn't nervous, but Genesis was a wreck. He's like, this is, no, we should, let's postpone it. No, we just go. That's the actual wing of the plane you see, and there's Quinn off for his, his first day, first day at school. So that's how we're connected with all this. Our relationship grew through Roger, through Mark, through Matt, through anybody really that's here. Anybody sitting in this room has had an impact on what we're doing, definitely doing in Ireland. So what's going on in Ireland? Let's do the spiritual climate of what's happening. Now, I hope you can see these pictures. How many have been to Ireland? Anybody? Nobody. Usually I get one smattering of somebody to take a video. You know, Lou almost came to visit us this year, which would have been great. Uh, usually I get a smattering of somebody who's at least holidayed over there. Now, if you go to Ireland and you meet the people, they're going to be very, very nice. But there'll be a nice wall around it where it'll be talking about the weather, how are you here on holiday, do you have Irish connections, all that stuff that nobody really cares about, but they're being very nice. It's almost like they're saying, well, can we have your money and then go home, is, is what they're saying. But they'll do it nicely, very nicely, and everybody will be very nice. But spiritually, Ireland is a very, very dark place. The photos you see behind me are from a town called Knock, like knock on the door, the town is called that. And in, as the story goes, in 1879, 15 people, about half of them were kids, saw a vision of the Apostle John, Joseph, Mary, and a baby lamb hovering about two feet off the ground. They didn't say anything, they didn't do anything. They just saw this. And from this vision in 1879, you see this sanctuary is brought up. These are statues over here of what they supposedly saw. There's confession booths put up. Pope John Paul visited in 1980, so they had to erect this giant cathedral in the middle of the, of the square. Outside of town, there's all the uh, businesses sell water bottles to get holy water, statues, rosary beads, anything idol-wise that you might want to find. Like I said, there's confession buildings, there's holy water fountain. Mass is performed regularly, and as you can see, Mary is paraded through as they say the rosary on some sort of pallet driver thing. None of this is biblical whatsoever. None of it. But this line of thinking permeates the Irish culture. This is what we walked into, if you will. One of the issues we face is if we're not Catholic, we must be Jehovah's Witnesses. That's just true. They say, oh, you're not in this big box of Catholicism. You must be in the Jehovah's Witness box. And then when we say, no, we're not Jehovah's Witnesses, you almost see the twitch. Like, I don't know where to put you. Where are we going to put you? So part of our ministry is building this Bible box saying, that's the box that we're in. That's the box we're in. But a lot of people don't, don't quite get that. I always say this. If you are, I'll use my best Irish name for a footballer. His name is Seamus O'Shea. If I'm Seamus O'Shea and I'm a 20-year-old Irishman, I've gone to public school, which is Catholic school, all my life. All my friends are Catholic. My mom is Catholic. My dad is Catholic. All my grandparents, everybody in our family tree is Roman Catholic. And I step in, why would you believe me? Seriously, why would you believe? I mean, I'm not the most handsome guy anyway, but why would you believe me? I wouldn't believe me if I was him. I don't want him to believe me. I need him to pull up the Bible and match what's in the Bible with what he's been taught. He's not, he doesn't really even know what he's supposed to believe, to be honest with you. But I need him to match it up against the Word of God and make a decision there. And that is huge. Because if he walks away and says, I believe the word of God and I have to leave, I have to leave the Catholic Church, 
The whole family's against it. All his friends, what are you doing? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Ostr- ostracized, it's a very tough thing. So I can't convert anybody. So if you're saying, how's the conversions going over there? I don't know. I've baptized one guy in the five years I've been there. He's a really, really, he was going to be here. Then he had a fourth kid. He didn't come. But uh, I baptized one guy. He's still a very devout Christian. His wife isn't. You know, so I can't convert anybody, but God can. My job is to proclaim the gospel, to tell people about Jesus, to show them what Jesus has done for them, to live my life in such a way that Jesus shines through, but the words also matter. The proclamation also matters too. And from that, God does the conversion. Like I could actually change somebody's heart. I think it's funny for somebody to even think that, but uh, only God can change the heart. So the percentages in Ireland are such. Ireland is the, has the lowest percentage of Bible-believing Christians of any English-speaking country in the world. It's, the Joshua Project has it at 0.47%. So when I visited Ireland and I met with the church in Ennis, the church in Ennis already knew where I was going to next because every Christian in Ireland knows every other Christian and they're talking to one another. When we have a conference, a preacher's conference, that's it. That's everybody. <laughs> That's everybody on the whole island, which is one-third the size of Wyoming with 10 times the population. That's all of us coming together. We have towns, approximately 50 towns of 7,000 7, people or more. They have no presence whatsoever. There's no church for them to turn to. You have choices here. You can go to this church, this church, this church, whatever your fancy is. Stay in this one. Okay, uh, But... The fact is, is nobody even has one to go to in all of those towns. There's people that are needed. The fields are wide open, but they're very rocky. If you've been to Ireland or you've seen pictures, you see the, the, the fences, they're all just rocks, the rock walls. They all come out of the fields. They're just there. They do it, which is interesting because my town, Castle Bar, during the downturn of the economy, decided they were going to spend into the town so when the economy came back up, they'd be ready. And they redid all the sidewalks in town and they made them all these, these rocks that are square and they, and they look really nice. But they imported every one of those from China. I was like, I got all those in the field next to my house. What are you doing? Just come and get them. But no, they imported them for some reason, but I guess that's why I don't do politics very well. So what do we do there? Here's are some of our ministries. I hope you can see some of these. We preach, I preach every, just about every other Sunday. Once we learned how to speak and act in Irish society, we kind of jumped in full speed. It wasn't that way kind of at first. We teach on Thursdays. They have the usual pastoral meetings that come about once you start a church. This person's hurting. This person's going through this. And you go, hey, that person's not right. Or uh, I think it was the last Sunday we were there. One of the, we have about 20 people that come to our church, so it's kind of nice to be in a mega church every now and again here. But we had 20 people, and one of the regular ladies came in and went right to the back row in the corner. And I just turned to Genesis, and I said, Jerry, something's wrong with Jerry, go. And that's what we do. You know, we have to do that within the church. Evangelism, of course, we go out onto the streets. St. Patty's Day was one of the best days ever because everybody's all in one place, and it's just like, I got you all now. You ain't going anywhere because there's a parade coming. So it's really great on that. My wife's a graphic designer, so any of the stuff out on the table that you see, she's made. She does all the graphics and portfolios and brochures and flyers and tracks and websites and everything, not only for us, but she also does it for all of the churches within the umbrella of Calvary Mission, which is what we're under. So she's very valuable. We've taught the youth group. Uh, My boys from the youth group have moved on. They got too old, but there's still girls left, so Genesis teaches the girls and and, gets, and has fun with the girls. We do special events. We bring in speakers on anxiety, depression, suicide. The suicide rate's very high in Ireland. So we'll bring in expert Christian speakers into our town and invite the whole town to come in and hear them. If we get one or two, it's, it's great. It does it. And some of the other ministries we do, we do kids clubs in the summer. I had the, I had the great honor of going to Romania to preach, which was great. Uh, they invited me over, and I got to preach a couple times and see the culture over there. The funny thing about that was is my friend was behind me translating, and I was kind of in the back of this church of about three to 400. And he goes, okay, it's your turn. Go on up. So I'm in the back, and I have to go whoop, 
whoop, whoop, all the way up to the front. And as I'm walking up to the front to get to the podium, I'm realizing there's nobody else at the podium. And I don't speak Romanian. And as I get there, I'm like, well, this is going to be the weirdest thing ever if I'm going to preach in Irish. And then it was like somebody took a dial and went, whoop, and this guy popped up next to me. Whoop. I look over, and he's right there, and he's like, at the last second, he, I go, dude, you could have come up here 12 seconds ago, and it would have been fine, but you had to pop up at the last second as my interpreter, and then you calmed down and preached through it and went through it. I do a radio program. It's a one-hour radio program, which is nothing short of a miracle itself to walk in and say, I want to do a show called Bible Talk about the Bible, play some Christian songs in there. Essentially, I expos- I pre- Essentially it's like three sermons of 20 minutes long where we exposit scripture and then move on with the songs and do it. And they let me do that every week for one hour, and it plays Sunday at 6 on the radio station. Some of you may or may not know about the Eighth Amendment in Ireland. Yes? No? No? Yes? Okay. The Eighth Amendment gives rights to the unborn child in Ireland, which makes abortion illegal in Ireland. It's one of the few countries in the world where abortion is right now actually illegal due to the Eighth Amendment. Well, there's a big movement right now for repealing the Eighth Amendment and allowing abortion to enter Ireland in some way, shape, or fashion. Now, I'll tell you this. When I was in university, or as you would say, college, um, I had my hand in two abortions. Sad to say. I had no idea, but those haunt me for the rest of my life. You look around and you see a 30-something-year-old, and you're like, yeah, that could have been my son or my daughter. I hope they would turn out like that or whatever, but... Uh, that that, ate, that eats at me probably more than anything else in my life. So this cause is very big for me, to keep the Eighth Amendment. And I said, well, what can I do? Well, I joined the pro-life campaign. There's a few different campaigns. And one of the things we did is started writing letters to the editor. And locally, they started to get published. And I was kind of shocked at that. But they did. They started to get published. And all of a sudden... One of them got published nationally, all the way across Ireland. I was on Facebook, and the pro-life thing pops up and says, hey, this, I- this was just published in the Irish Examiner. Take a look at it. It's kind of a cool article. I was like, oh, okay, I'll read it. I started reading, and I was like, boy, this really sounds familiar. What is this? That's mine. So we continue to keep writing for that and, and continue to go. I don't go door to door for it. Because some of the people are saying, hey, why don't you come door to door and help us with the pro-life campaign? I was like, well, as big of a a project as I see that is and and as important as I see it is, it's more important for me to go door to door with the gospel. I want to help people eternally. So if I'm going to go door to door, I'm not going to do it for that. I'm going to do it for Christ. So that's what I've decided to do with that. But I do other things for the pro-life campaign to to help them out and, and get going with it. We do kids clubs. We'll be doing kids clubs in August. Obviously, I will not be there. So we flew in. Well, they flew in. And there's a couple staying at our house from Michigan. And they'll go take our place at the kids clubs. And we go to a bunch of different estates and, I'm sorry, subdivisions. They're called estates in Ireland. And we would go and teach the kids and do all those things. So that's kind of the gist of what I do. Now, usually the question comes up is, what's a regular day for you? And a regular day for me is this. I get my son ready, and I take him to school at 9. From 9 to 3, I'm downtown evangelizing or doing whatever it is we need to do. At 3 o'clock, I pick him up, and I bring him home, and I either have to take him to piano or tennis or whatever kids do nowadays. The days I don't have to do that, I go and I minister to whoever it is. If it's the right evening, me and my good buddy Sam, who's about this tall and kind of a muscle guy, we'll go downtown at nighttime and talk to people outside the pubs having cigarettes, because you can't smoke in pubs in Ireland. So they go outside to have cigarettes, and we'll go outside and talk to them there. Now that's interesting. It is interesting. It's a bit of fun, too. And nothing's ever happened to us. I I always say, because Sam's a big guy, so nothing ever really happens to us. But it would look something like this. Three guys standing outside a pub. And I can walk up and say, hey, guys, I have two, you know that the, the first bill in the euro is a five. There's no one or two bill. They're all coins up to that point. I have a two-euro coin. This will pay for half of your next pint if you can rattle off 10 beers in the next 20 seconds. Go. No problem. 
They can rattle those off and no problem. Flick the coin to them. Let's up the ante a little bit. Here's 10 euro. If you can rattle off the Ten Commandments in order, this is yours. Nobody's ever gotten the Ten Commandments in order. I think you're not supposed to lie. I don't think you're supposed to steal. Like, okay, well, we'll put that back in. I'll tell you what. Let's up this even further. Here's 20 euro. If I can ask you a few questions and you prove to me you are a good person, this 20 is yours. And your two buddies here are going to be the judge of whether you get it. You ever told a lie? And his buddies just lose it at that point. Yes, of course he's lied. He lied to us earlier tonight. Okay. Have you ever stolen anything? Buddies are like, yeah, of course he has. You ever use God's name as a curse word? Sure, yeah, I've done that. Okay. Have you ever looked at a woman with lustful intentions? Yeah, I just did that 10 seconds ago. All right. All right, well, according to the Bible, you're a liar, you're a thief, you're an adulterer at heart, and you're a blasphemer. And if God judges you by those, would, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's where the conversation goes. And his buddies, it kind of gets quiet at that point. And it's like, yeah, I guess I'd go to hell. I said, well, sorry the 20 euro isn't yours, but you've been a good sport. Do you know what God did so you don't have to go to hell? No, what did he do? Well, 2,000 years ago, God came down in the form of a man, Jesus Christ. And he went to the cross. So you don't have to take the penalty for what he's taking on. He's going to take the penalty for you on the cross. And you're free. You're standing before the judge. And the judge has let you go. Is that something you think might be important for you? You get all kinds of things from that. We walk away. Nobody's been beaten up, especially me. And the gospel's gotten to him. You give him a track with all of our addresses on it. It has all of our information on it. And we move on to the next pub. And away we go. And that can be an evening. So that kind of wraps up like what we do. I also live by what I call the five-minute rule. There was a church in Wyoming, a different town, where the pastor told me this. It's not something I invented. I live by the five-minute rule. So if that says, the five-minute rule is this, and this is my personal rule. If you want to take it, take it. It's not biblical by any means, but it's something I do. If I'm in the presence of somebody for five minutes or more, and I don't know if they're a Christian or not, they're going to hear the gospel. So when I flew from Georgia to Indianapolis to get back home, the guy sitting next to me, do you think I'm going to be sitting next to him for more than five minutes? Yeah, the flight's a little longer than that. He's going to hear about the gospel. How about if I sit at a, a restaurant, but the tables are all full and I'm sitting across from somebody? If it's going to be more than five minutes, I'm going to chat with him, give him the gospel. Is your husband here? Okay. Um, <laughs> Five-minute rule has changed everything. By, for it not only gets the gospel to people who haven't heard it, but for example, the guy in the plane happened to be a Christian. And he's like, hey, tell me more about your ministry. What are you doing over there? Do you have any information? It's like, I didn't expect that. I expected him to be a non-Christian, but he actually turned out to be a Christian. That happens every now and again too. So the five-minute rule is just something that I force myself to do. Other ministries, the kids' club and everything, but through all this, our little church has grown. We actually have our own little marquee up front. My wife made it. I'm bragging. And uh, we're in the center of town, almost in the dead center of town. And this little thoroughfare you see through here goes from a big parking area to the center of town. So this is the St. Patty's Day Parade. So when people are going up to the center of town for the parade, they have to walk by our building. So we set up out front. We're set up inside with face painting and children's coloring. But you can see my friend Larry over here. He's telling the gospel to these folks outside as they're passing by. And you give out literature with signs. And I'll tell you what, putting our sign up and having our own building has changed everything. Now when I talk to somebody, oh, you're the church. Oh, you guys are the ones. What's going on in there? I've seen that up there now for a while. I'll tell you what, Irish society is so gossip-oriented that when that sign went up, it wasn't 10 minutes before everybody in town knew that that sign had gone up. That's just the way it is but they don't know what's inside it. So they'll ask about what's going on inside and that opens up everything for us too. People noticed it immediately. It gave us credibility and that allows us to do all our events inside there too, which has been fantastic. 
Now, before you change the next slide, hold on. Let me give you a little insight about me and the learning experience this has been. This is kind of the tough part for me. Because when I arrived, I was ready to go. The first day, I'm going to go downtown, and I'm going to show these Irish Christians how to evangelize. I'm American. I had my tracks in hand, woke up early, and I got town, downtown between 7.30 and 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, in America, we're halfway through the day. In Ireland, it's a ghost town. So, well, I'll wait till 8. Still a ghost town. 9 o'clock, the Guinness truck pulled up. Hey, Guinness driver, <laughs> I'll talk to you. Nothing opens in Ireland till 10. But what I learned over the last few years was it's been all about me. What can I do? How can I show the churches back home that we're doing something? How can I show these folks that brought us over that we're doing something? It was all pride. And then I read in John chapter 3 about one of my favorite biblical characters. Never performed a miracle. This man never wrote a book of the Bible. And I'm talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist had one job, and it was to point to Jesus. That's it. My whole life, all his training, everything he did in the woods, eating his locusts and honey, everything was to do one thing and point to Jesus. And he did it so well that Jesus called him the greatest among men. But when he pointed to Jesus, all his followers, except a few, took off for Jesus like they should have. But the few that were left behind said, hey, that one guy you pointed to, everybody's going to him and they're flocking to him. And what I love is what John the Baptist didn't do. He didn't say, okay, let's form a committee. We need a marketing plan. I'll go on TV and say, hey, you know what? I was wrong. Everybody come on back. Oh, he didn't do any of that, did he? He said, my joy is complete. He must increase and I must decrease. And when I read that, I said, I've been doing this all wrong. This has been too much me, not enough him. And I've learned, I think, probably over the last couple of years, step out of the way. Be a missionary. Represent who you're supposed to represent. But none of this has ever been about me. It's always been about him. Christ is everything. What if I was to be glorified through my own embarrassment and glorify Christ through my embarrassment, through an embarrassing situation? Would I do that? Well, now I would. I probably wouldn't have done that two years ago. But now I'm gladly, I'll step in there and let people laugh at me. So through all that, we've been asked to do something. The, the leader of Calvary Church came up to me and he says, look, you planted this church in Castle Bar and it's running great. I'd like you to consider planting a new one in this town called Boyle. Do we have any moviegoers here? People like watch a lot of movies? Okay. Do you know the actor Chris O'Dowd? You ring a bell? He's from this town. His dad actually still lives here in this town. The whole, the whole show called Moon Boy was filmed in this town, and there's kind of a small cult following with this, and they come in and, and, do, and they do tours and stuff here. Uh, for some of maybe the older crowd that remember the original Tarzan movie, Jane was from this town. Maureen O'Sullivan. Obviously, she's long past. This is one of those towns that has no evangelical presence. There's no church. There's nobody there to help. There's not even a match lit in this dark place. So with that, I'm going to ask you guys for a few things. Number one and most important, if you have any kind of prayer list, Grab a prayer card out there on the table and pray for us. Put us on the list. I'd request the top, but I'm sure there's other things that you have. But if we're on the list, I'm happy enough. Okay? But what I'm asking you to do is really important here. I'm asking you to walk into the throne room of God himself, the creator of the universe, and ask him, will you bless this endeavor to boil? Will you bless this church plant? Will you provide safety for the family? Will you provide a place to live? Will you provide all the proper funds to get a church plant off the ground? Will you give them a house to live and, and give Quinn a safe school to go to? Will you give him friends, new friends in a new town? All of that before the creator of the universe. This is a big deal I want you to do. I'm asking you, through Jesus, to walk in and ask God for us. My prayer is you'll do that. Now, the next thing I need is people. Maybe it's you. 
Maybe it's you. Who's it going to be, brother? Maybe it is somebody you know. But we need people to come with us. I'm looking for people to come over for three years. Now, I know I'm, <laughs> I think about that when I ask. I'm like, I'm just asking somebody to uproot their whole life, move all the way across the ocean, and help plant the church in a culture that they know nothing about. Who's going to do that? And then I realized, oh, I did that. I stood in front of a church in 2008 in Boise, Idaho, and a friend of mine stood up and said, I've been to China, and I'm going back on missions. And I said, I turned to my wife, and I said, I think I'd like to do that. And she goes, of course you would. I'm not going. <laughs> so I went. I think she hoped I'd get the whole missions thing out of my system. And I came back, and I said, I had it set up where we're going to go to, we were going to China. I'll teach English. I have the place to live. We can preach on Sundays. It's great. I got it all set. And she just said, I'm not going to China. Now, look, I've been married a while, and I know you can drag your wife to a lot of places, but China generally isn't one of them if she doesn't want to go. But she agreed we should be in missions and pursue missions. So we decided we're going to go to an English-speaking country, not named South Africa, and that limited it kind of to Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, and Ireland. Ireland weeded itself out, and here we are today looking to go on this new church plant, asking somebody else to catch that vision, and if you do, contact me. We'll chat about it. Or maybe you're going, you know what? My son has been looking for something like this, and maybe he should go do it. Or maybe he should be talking. Or I know this person or that. Anything. Please, just get a hold of me. We need him. And of course, you guys have been supporting us since before time began here as a church. There's also people sitting in here that support us individually on top of that. I can't thank you enough. We're looking for also a nest egg to plant this church, to be able to walk into the town, get our little building so people know we're there, or work in some way, shape, or form. We do need a bit of a nest egg, a one-time financial support to get going in there. The town is called Boyle. It's in the next county over. It's about an hour away from my house where I live now, but because it's in the next county over, it might as well be 10,000 miles away in the Irish mind because it's the next county, and nobody's going to go to Roscommon. Roscommon is kind of the dregs of of Ireland, if you will. It's in the center of it. Our hope is to be able to have people lined up raising funds here quickly enough where we can move next summer and do that. So if you would take all of that into the throne room of God and ask him, I would really, really appreciate. But as we said this, missions isn't a one-way street. A lot of ways to stay connected with us. We have a monthly... We, we, we send out a newsletter. Some send it out every six months, some every three months. We do it every month. Hey, here's what we're doing this month. Here's what's going on. Here's Quinn's Corner. Here's the funny thing about Quinn at the bottom. If you want to be a part of that and get that email, there's a sheet right outside on the table. Print your name nicely and your email legibly, and we'll add you to it. And if, I don't know who's, who's part of missions or who, who's leading missions anymore, but that, that one newsletter from 2013 has to come down. <laughs> we'll get a new one up there for you. It's no problem. Uh, we have our website, irelandmissionaries.com. I just revamped all of that. You can get all the information on Boyle, everything I talked to you about here today on that. And of course, I probably stay in touch with the majority of you on Facebook, but if we don't find you on Facebook, there's the sign up there. Now, sometimes when I do this at the bigger churches, my Fitbit ends up notifying me that somebody's sitting out there with their iPhone going, add a friend. As you're standing up here, you get two new friends. But most of you are already friends anyway, and I always think it's funny we do that. We have no reason we shouldn't be in touch. You have prayer requests. I just gave you one of mine. I want to hear yours. When I, go into my, when I go into the throne room of God, what can I pray for for you? This isn't a one-way street. This is a two-way street. You guys just sent me to a town to proclaim the gospel. I often use the reference of Mammoth Cave like I did before. If you've been to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky... You get to go down into the cave, and it's this giant, giant cavern. And you got the light on your head, and the, guy, the guide says, okay, everybody shut their lights off. And you shut your lights off, and you're standing in absolute pitch darkness. And he lights a small little match, and it lights up the whole cave. One little light in this dark town will make a huge difference for eternity for a lot of these people. We want this boil thing to be our last stop. This is it. I'm 50. It's like, 
let's get people in so I can train them in Boyle, raise Boyle, the Boyle church up, and send them out to the next town. And then bring new people in. Train them up. Raise up the Boyle church. Send them out to a new town. Right now, the, you know, the group we're in, Calvary Mission, has six churches. But by next year, we should have nine. Two of the churches are already being planted. One went out this week to Loch Ray in County Galway. The next one's going to Longford in County Longford, and we would potentially go to Boyle. The churches are growing. We're trying to get out there and do our thing, and we want you guys to be a part of it. I don't even want you to be a part of it. You already are whether you want to or not, and we appreciate that. Now, what I'll do now is open it up for a few questions, if you have them, and then we'll see about maybe trying to get this song. Now, there's actions you guys have to do with this song. You're involved with it, just so you know. Are there any questions? Anything? Yes. Oh, okay. That's great. I should have explained that. Great question, Ben. Calvary Mission was an organization. It's not affiliated with anybody in the States or even in Ireland. It's its own entity. And it was started by one man, one Irishman named Podge Movahill, and he started the Westport Church under the banner of Calvary Mission. You saw our church sign up there. It said Calvary Church Castle Bar. Okay. Calvary Mission is kind of the umbrella that covers over the whole church. We go under their constitution, which is fine. It would match up perfectly with this church's constitution, so I didn't have a problem with it. And um, that, under that umbrella, they started in Westport. Then they ended up in the town called Ballina. Then they ended up in Charlestown. They planted Charlestown. Then Claire Morris. And then we did Castle Bar. And then there was a church in Ross Common Town that was already existing that decided to come under already, already existing and come under. So we have six churches that way. That's what Calvary Mission is. It's just one man with a vision to plant churches across Ireland and bringing people in to do it. They're not affiliated with anyone. We just happen to be under them. We would be autonomous, by the way. Our church would. It would just be under that umbrella. If you read through, and you can read, there's stuff out there about them. Their constitution would be light to allow the churches their own autonomy on certain matters. We have people with differing views on baptism that are involved in differing churches, but they can't promote those differing views within Calvary Mission. Okay, so if you believed in infant baptism, you, say you came from Northern Ireland to serve in Calvary Mission from a Presbyterian church, you would believe in infant baptism and be a part of your culture and what you do. You can't promote that under Calvary Mission because it's not part of the, it's not part of the Constitution. Are you with me on this? You see what I'm saying? So they, all the essentials, they're fine, but they just can't promote something beyond that to do it. There's a lot of different things that fall in that category. We can get together and chat about that if you want. So, anything else? Come on, it can't just be one question. All right, do we do the song or not? You into it? All right, we have to learn this. The song is called Wild Rover. Does anybody know this? It's kind of a prodigal son. You know this. You play it. Okay, so you can, do the you can help me with the clapping to teach that. You can teach that section, the clapping. <laughs> so it's during the chorus. The chorus would go, no, nay, never. And then you're going to do four claps. So it's no, nay, never. No, nay, never, no more. And then we usually do two claps, but we'll save you from that if you want. <laughs> but the four claps are very important. All right? So let's give it a... We're, we're just going to run through the chorus here to make sure you have it. So I'm just not up here looking like a, a publican. Oh, this is the first time I've done this on this trip. This is absolutely fantastic. You guys are with me. By the way, you guys are much more lively than any Irish congregation I've ever been in front of. <laughs> Take that for what it's worth. So that's the part we just read. So it's no You got it. I've been a wild rover for many a year. I spent all my money on whiskey and beer. But 
Now I'm returning with gold and great store. It's never to play the wild rover no more. And it's no, nay, never. No, nay, never, no more. Will I play the wild rover? No, nay, never, no more. I went into an alehouse I used to frequent. The landlady, me money was spent. She I asked her for credit, she answered me nay. Such a custom of yours I could have any day, and it's no, nay, never. No, nay, never, no more will I play the wild rover. No, nay, never. From my pocket, ten sovereigns so bright, and the landlady's eyes will they dance with delight. I have all the whiskeys and wines that are best, and the words that I told you were surely in jest, and it's no nay, never, no nay, never, no more will I play. That's what I've done And ask them to pardon their prodigal son And when they've caressed me as oft times before I never will play the wild rover no more And it's no, nay, never No, nay, never, no more Will I play the wild rover It's no, nay, never. No, nay, never, no more will I play the wild rover. No, nay, never, no more. Now, if you go to Ireland, everybody will know that song. Everybody. And you'll hear it ten times. And now you know when to clap and do your thing. Guys, thank you guys so much. You have... Uh, you have um, kept us there, got us there, and you've made a difference, not in my life, but you've made a difference in the lives of a lot of people you don't even know. I'll give you some examples. Obviously, we, our house is empty as we're here. I leave the back window open for our cat, who's named Fuista, common spelling on that, F-A-O-I-S-T-E. It's Irish for fudge long story. And uh, it was like, I'm just going to leave the window open and leave some food out for her and she'll be fine. Well, one of our neighbors said, I'll check in on her twice a day. Twice a day. And that's only because I've been in my neighborhood for four years and met all my neighbors and know all my neighbors. That's you guys. That's you guys making an impact on a lady named Ann Prendergast. Brendan, Brendan Heenahan runs a shop in town. Brendan and I disagree on just about everything. Literally everything. From Donald Trump to how to run a business. But one thing Brendan knows is where I go to church and what I believe about God. And he knows what the gospel is. Because you guys sent us there. You guys sent us there. Sam Anav. Sam Anav is British. Sam came into church kind of a burly fighter guy. We hit it off immediately, of course. Sam is the one I baptized. Sam's probably my best friend in Ireland. But Sam probably wanted to leave the church three or four times just because he didn't like somebody else in it. Sam had to mature as a Christian. He probably wouldn't be a Christian today if you guys didn't keep us over there. Sam's wife, Dawn, is Catholic, as Catholic can be. And she gets it from her family left and right. But she comes to church every Sunday. Without you guys, she wouldn't be coming to church every Sunday. Lorraine. Lorraine's from, Ire or from North Dublin. So everything is about tings and this and that. But she comes to church every Sunday. She can quote Bible verses. She reads like nobody's business. The problem with Lorraine is trying to convince her she is a Christian. There's something there. But she comes to church every Sunday. Her husband, Brendan, 
not even close to being a Christian, he used to sit outside in his car, wait for her to be done. She'd come out, go off they go. Brendan now comes into church. We've got to know Brendan, hang out with Brendan, watch football with Brendan, and get the gospel to Brendan every Sunday and beyond. That's because you guys have us there. There's countless other people in town. There's John Moore who runs, runs the fish place, the fish and chip shop that I go see every time and do it. There's plenty of Polish people I could run off to you. You know more people speak Polish as a first language than speak Irish in Ireland? The Irish language is dying, so that's probably not surprising. But Polish people have, uh, the Eastern Europeans, it's a big community. And it's an also another ministry for us. So we're not only impacting the Irish folks, we're impacting around the world. There's a Romanian couple that comes to our church. They took us over to Romania to preach. We've gone to Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, all those things because you guys sent us over there to do that. You guys sit, we sit here in the capital of Wyoming in this little church in Cheyenne and your tentacles have stretched around the world. There's a great picture I saw. I don't even remember what church I saw it in, but it's a missions picture of the world and in the middle of whatever city they're in, it's like a stone was thrown there and these ripples go out from that. And that's what's happened here. You're going to Africa. You're in, in Europe. Asia, you're across the world from little Cheyenne. You guys did that. I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you guys so much. Will you pray with me? And then we can, we can end this. Father in heaven, I'm just so grateful to be back here today. You know I feel my home is in Ireland, but this is definitely my home away from home. There was just something relaxing about walking through the door today and being with family. Thank you for all the people you provide for us, all the people that want to see the gospel go out among all the nations. Thank you for everything you give. I pray for my wife and son as they're back with grandma. And I pray for all the folks back home that when we arrive, you're, you're already, already working on their hearts, already infiltrating their minds so when we talk to them, they're already softened. Lord, thank you for what you do. And I pray for this church plant. As I come before you today, will you bless it? Will you make it a reality? Nothing that we can do, but it's all for your glory. And it's to see people with you eternally. In Jesus' name, amen. I guess when I do things, I ask myself, is this going to matter 300 million years from now? Seriously. If it's going to matter 300 million years from now, I think it's a good thing. Let's get on it. Right? If you have questions, come on up after. I'll be able to talk to you. It would be great. Thank you so much.